Hey, Tony. Hey, how are you? Let me uh, see. I'm having a few technical issues. I apologize. Our board meeting ran over a little bit. I'm making you post. So I see a, a David Kennard. Um, is that a relative? The last name? Yes. Yeah, that's my father. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Great to have you with us. Just adjust this. I'm not sure why am I. Yeah, Tony, if you want to make me a co-host too, then oh, like, that that would be great. I'm not sure what it off my lights. during the board meeting, but mm -hmm. uh, I lost connectivity for for a moment. So um, let me pull you up. Excellent. Colin, uh, forgive me. Did you send a bio uh, uh, for for just general introductions? If not, um, you know, I, I don't think I did. I don't remember. Sorry, if you asked me for that, I my space. I, you know, I, I I may not have. I've just been I've been so incredibly busy that uh, it probably just slipped my mind entirely. That's okay. I'll, I'll give it a thought. Can uh, introduce myself. Hey, Paul, how are you? How are your bees doing? Hey, Bernie. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a hive minder set up on any of your hives? No, I haven't gotten that far right now. Okay. Um, I, we're trying to get I, I, internet to the corner yeah. where they are, but not yet. Yeah, I. Uh, likewise, I haven't done that myself. I was just looking at um, the survey and suggested topics and someone uh, asked for data collection and analysis of your hives. And I thought it might be cool to get someone from Broodminder or one of the other competing competitors. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love that because my new apiary, I have internet there. I'm going to set up a camera and it'd be nice to put a couple of Broodminders in there, especially my new uh, long hive. I'm going to add that to my to-do list, see if I can reach out to um, someone over at the company and see if they will do a uh, do a talk for us in uh, April. Mm. I haven't heard back from uh, the National Weather Service or there's a, um, a a private forecasting company here based in Boston um, that has an app. And I reached out to them to see whether uh, they could come on and talk about weather forecasting, weather apps. Um, yeah. uh, been no response from them, but it would be nice to get someone in. Uh, I'll have to start seeing if anybody knows a meteorologist. Um, 
had a professor of meteorology at UMass Lowell and uh, MIT, and yeah. uh, haven't heard back from either of them for over a month. So I'll send out a reminder. And yeah, my main project this year is one building. I finally got into Artists Asylum. Uh, into oh, really? Shop. So I'm uh, I'm building bee equipment right now. And I'm building something called a Morris board. It's a flavor of Snow Grove board. Okay. Um, it's a sl almost obscure um, board. And, uh, but it's for small production of queens, you know, Very like cool. one, two, or five a month per hive. So, and if it works, I'll have a, nice talk at the in this fall or next winter excellent so and then i'm really into this talk because i have to set up a, a remote bear fence up in maine in my summer apiary you have a lot of customers in maine yeah yeah i i'd, I'd imagine yeah actually one of our biggest is uh wyman's blueberries oh yeah i bet yeah. the yeah, the black bears love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they uh, they have a lot of fence setups. Uh, you'll see actually a couple pictures, or one picture at least, of uh, one of their setups. You know, they truck in these tractor trailer trucks full of hives, and they have to set them up. And you know, they're there for just a few weeks, they yeah. just do their job, and then they're off to the next job. So, you know, big investment to protect while they're essentially rented to them, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, you'll, you'll, you'll mention what they are and I'll ask questions at the end. Sure. So. All that tasty brood sitting, sitting in the middle of the woods. Yeah. And I know there are black bears because uh, I grew up in that area. There's a couple around. Oh, yeah. No, it's actually, I think we've heard a lot more that the bigger issue is becoming quote unquote urban bears because they're yeah. the ones that are getting, they're moving south and they're getting a little bit more comfortable with uh, the urban setting. And so they're causing an issue for a lot of folks that even if you live in the city or, you know, you guys are all the Middlesex County groups. So I'm sure a lot of your members are somewhat, uh, maybe not urban, but, you know, suburban. Uh, and it still can be a very, very big issue. Yeah, I think Alan, who's in Belmont, he had a bear. My apiary is about 20, I don't know, <clears throat> 10 miles away from a bear sighting up in Belrica. Um, you know, I asked my friend, you ever seen a bear? And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> you, you just tell me if something touches those and I'll have a bear fence here in about 48 hours. <laughs> But I'll probably put one there eventually. Tony, you just say the word whenever. Yep, I'm, I'm going to give it two more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Happy to. Uh, have to hang on. But right now, I'm frantically sending out a reminder. Inbox sent. Traps. How is everybody's hives surviving so far through this winter? One of mine are still going. One of the two that I went into winter with and the other one had some activity, but I'm not sure uh, they're not as strong. I didn't see as many uh, little courses in front of it today as I have in the past and as I have with the other one. So tough year, you know, given mm -hmm. the drought and um, viral uh, mite loads. I have three and uh, uh, two are doing, uh, well, all three are, are doing well, good, good, uh, good clusters. Um, but one of them is at the very top of the box. So I got to start feeding like soon. 
Yeah. The other two, the other two seem, seem okay. I got, I got some Nozema on one of them as well, which is, which is a bit concerning, but I have some old frames in there. I got to, I got to pull, uh, I got to pull next year and see if I can just, just get, get all, all, all clean, clean, uh, clean frames in there. So. Hey, Colin, I, I just want to let you know, I, I have to leave at the bottom of the hour because of, uh, work it's purely work has no interest no no, no lack of, of interest <laughs> so oh that's no problem i just I, just, I didn't want you to think i was leaving because of lack of interest like oh no i'm very yeah. much interested in this this is the new world we live in so yeah, yeah, come but, and go and i know there's no downtime anymore <laughs> get it you know no problem <laughs> work, work is always getting in the way of my fun <laughs> well hopefully you won't hear my three and a half year old screaming or running up and yeah. down the hall behind me but yeah um if you overhear that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, norm. That's the that's the new norm. That's right. Yeah, sure is. Colin, you can go go ahead and get started, and other people will drift in as, as they drift in. Okay. All right. Um, well, first, just a thank you for inviting me uh, to your club. Uh, again, my name is Colin Kennard. I, um, with my family, own a uh, small company up in New Hampshire called Wells Crop Fence Systems. And we do uh, a lot of livestock inclusion, but also uh, predator and wildlife exclusion. So um, Tony's nicely asked me here today to talk to you guys about bear fence, uh, beehive protection, uh, which is definitely a big part of what we do. Um, our geographic range is pretty much Northeast. Uh, we're specialized in New England. So um, we're used to the climate, the weather conditions, and all the stuff that uh, gets thrown at us. So, um, I've been running the company for uh, a few years now, but certainly have been a part of it and working uh, side by side my family for over 20. So, I have a pretty good handle on uh, a lot of these things. And uh, uh, one part of my job I really enjoy is actually going out and visiting other. Uh, customers' farms and taking photographs. So a lot of the photos you're going to see are ones I've taken. Um, so I always put it always put it out there in the beginning. I'm happy to uh, come take some photos of you guys uh, in your fencing. That's part, part of uh, part of what I do is collect photos. So um, so I have a sh uh, just brief housekeeping here. Uh, my slideshow. I'm going to I'm going to breeze right through it pretty quick um, at a good pace. So we have time for questions at the end. That being said, uh, if you have a pertinent question on the topic I'm talking about or question about the picture that's uh, up on the screen, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, unmute yourself or um, I got the chat window open here on the side. So um, I'll try and keep an eye on that as well. And uh, Tony, maybe if people feed you questions, uh, feel free to interrupt and, uh, and uh, let me know what the questions are. So I'm going to just uh, share screen here and we'll get going. All right. Just making sure. Okay, I think we're good. Obviously, that picture there is not what you want to see when you walk out the next morning. Um, so, beehive fencing is ex extremely important, um, primarily for if you want to continue your hobby of beekeeping. And, uh, you know, I know it is like many of our hobbies, it, it can be an expensive hobby. Um, so just getting going with your hives, you know, I know it can run you $1,500 probably uh, starting uh, and it goes up from there. So of course, uh, in, in just a matter of minutes, a lot of damage can be done. And so that's the reason why uh, it's really important to protect them. Just uh, briefly again, uh, a little bit about our company. Obviously we do livestock inclusion predator exclusion, so everything from deer fence to critter fence, you know, garden fence, um, to what we're talking about today, beehives. We also do a little overhead uh, crop protection with some netting, and we do a lot of trellising supplies for orchards and, and the like. Um, you know, big bulk of our business when we started was livestock inclusion. Um, and again, that was in 1978. Over the years, we have migrated a little bit, so probably more so now, uh, the bigger bulk of our business is wildlife exclusion, uh, keeping things out. And as we continue to uh, 
you know, take over certain areas, uh, wildlife have fewer and fewer places to go. And so it, it is an issue um, trying to keep all kinds of different things out. So whether you have a vegetable garden or you're raising poultry or in your case, beehives, it's pretty important. Um, so what I usually like to do is just briefly start talking about electric fence and how it works uh, to give you a little overview of that. Because if you, if, if you understand the basics of what how electric fence works, it will significantly help you in keeping a really good fence. Um, we start with the two categories. We basically have electric and non-electric. What those are really is nothing more than a psychological fence and a physical fence. Your, your woven wire, uh, eight foot tall physical fences with you know, heavy duty posts, things like that, those are designed to be physical fences. Deer can run into them and bounce off them. Um, you know, things can't, uh, you know, chew through them. They can't, you know, it's, it's a physical fence. Um, on the other side of the coin, you have a psychological fence. That is something usually that is very lightweight. Um, it is not, you know, a bear or anything can just physically walk right over it. No problem. It's like a piece of string. But, when you add electric current to it and you train your, your wildlife or your livestock to it, you're basically creating a psychological fence. That is, that is the nuts and bolts. That is a, what an electric fence is, is a psychological fence. So there's a lot of, you know, several factors we're going to talk about on how to create that. Um, and, and that's most important in, in keeping your electric fence. So I like this little, um, this little cartoon here, maybe some of you have seen it. I, I realize it's livestock, not, not a, uh, a bear photo, but nonetheless, caption says, look, if it was electric, could I do this? And you have this cow sitting on the electric fence there, but the farmer is about to throw the switch. So, you know, those, those cow friends are like getting ready to watch this cow get fried. Um, you know, electric fence obviously uh, can have some voltage in it that when uh, you electrify it, you know, creates a shock, which is painful to the animal um, and creates a negative experience. How that really happens, um, and I try and simplify it with this little diagram. And again, sorry, this is just a, a cow photo here, stock uh, diagram coming right from one of our manufacturers. But if you pretend the cow is a bear for a moment, you can think of it like this. You have your energizer. And you have two poles on the energizer. One goes to the ground, and then one goes to the fence. That's your hot terminal. The, the energizer puts out output voltage, um, and it puts out a certain number of joules. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And that voltage needs to come from one terminal all the way back around to the other terminal. So what you do is you set up this, um, this directional flow uh, that being your fence, you put all this voltage out into the fence where it actually just sort of is suspended. It's in this state of waiting. And what it's waiting for is something to come into contact with it to, so it can return that voltage back to the ground field. Now, to go to the ground field for a minute, if you think about the ground field, what that is is basically, I like to think of it as an antenna. It's the collector for your return voltage. The better ground you have, the better antenna you have, the better that that voltage is going to find its way back. So what's going to complete that circuit? Ideally, it's going to be your livestock or your, or your predator in this case. But there are other things that can affect it. Grass, vegetation, you know, anything that's conductive, it has moisture in it. Um, if there's lots of grass and vegetation on the fence, that's going to re return that circuit. And it's going to reduce the overall voltage that you have in your fence. So in this case, we want to try and keep vegetation off of it. Um, you know, if you have a broken insulator or something like that, that can, can create a, um, a voltage return. We like to call that a short. If it's, if it's something you don't want, vegetation, broken insulator, et cetera, a branch, that's a short, something that's touching the fence that you don't want to touch the fence. You're losing voltage because something is interrupting that flow. Ideally, you have no shorts in your fence so that when a bear or animal does touch the fence, they become the short and they complete the circuit. And the maximum amount of voltage that's coming out of that energizer is going through them 
through the ground, back to the ground field, back to the energizer. So that's, and that's it. So the more we can do to keep our fence clean, and when I say clean, meaning free of shorts, and vegetation, things like that, the better overall voltage we'll have. Uh, of course, there are other factors that affect the grounding. We'll talk about that a little bit too. But um, all in all, if you have an ideal, you know, day of moisture and you know adequate soil and all that good stuff, this is a really good system. Very, very effective. Um, I do like to mention that there is a sort of a mo uh, common misconception, which is the electric fence has to complete a circle. The fence itself does not. You can set up electric fence in a straight line, and it'll be completely fine. You can set up on one side of the barn and end on the other side of the barn. Um, what does have to complete the circle is that circuit that I just talked about. So um, our types of fence, we're going to breeze through this high tensile smooth. That's something you typically see with livestock, not so much with, with our bare fences. Low tension semi-permanent, we call it quick fence. That's something that can be taken down uh, very easily and moved, or it can be left there, doesn't matter. Poly wire, tape, and rope, all those systems. Again, lots of pretty common for livestock, but you'll see a couple here with, with beehives. And then the last one, which is what we're going to focus on a bit today, is the electric netting. It's a really, really nice all-in-one sort of fence, um, and it's excellent for beehive uh, protection. The energizer, also known as a charger, um, controller, a zapper, I've heard all kinds of different terms. I don't care what you call it, but it's the unit that's creating that energy putting it out into the fence um, in the form of joules. So uh, we measure the power, the output of an energizer in joules. How many joules it has is um, basically how, how well that energizer is going to be able to power the, the length of fence that you have. Um, one common thing you'll see when you're shopping for an energizer is a lot of times on the package, it'll say good for you know X number of miles, 10 miles or 40 acres or you know, it's usually, it's usually a linear or um, uh, area measurement. However, we don't really like to use those measurements. It's a little bit misleading because there are so many other factors that come into play. Grounding, the type of conductor, how well does it conduct electricity? Um, you know, what type of resistance is there in, inherent in that, con, in that uh, you know, electric line? All kinds of different factors. So. We basically, we sum it up, you know, the more jewels you have, the better that that energizer, the better ability it has to push its power um, across the distance of your fence. Uh, so higher the jewels, the bigger farm or the bigger uh, area you can power. And we help a lot of people with this. So if you don't know, I mean, that's what we're here for. You can call us. We'll go through our types here. So plug in very quickly, pretty, pretty much, you know, very common. Um, easy to install, doesn't require a lot of, um, it, it doesn't cost a lot to run, you know, it's very minimal, you won't really notice your utility bill going up or anything like that. Um, obviously you have to put it near an outlet, so just keep that in mind. We don't like to use extension cords because, you know, if you're running this across your back, back lawn or something, uh, you're going to have to move it every time you mow the lawn or you have to be very careful. There are other ways to do that, and we can go into that, but best practice is to run an insulator wire from, from your plug at wherever the energizer is installed out to your bee fence, or you can go another route, which we'll get into next. Uh, and if you do plug in, use a plug-in energizer, it's best to use a surge protector. It's just like, you know, you wanna protect your computer or TV equipment in your house. Um, it's very important to protect your energizer as well. And I will add that one of the reasons that uh, an energizer is an attractive uh, target for lightning voltage surges is because it has its own ground rod. So uh, unlike your house with its, you know, copper utility ground uh, somewhere outside, all of our ground rods for electric fencing are galvanized steel um, and, you know, pretty good and, and very attractive for lightning and other surges. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit more uh, coming up. But So there's your basic plug-in. Again, best bang for your buck as far as um, uh, the size of the energizer you can get uh, most economically. Next, you can always go to battery plug -in, battery energizer, uh, 12 volt. You can run it. There's lots of different kinds. This one here in the picture is runs on four D cell batteries. And that'll run, you know, there's two, two uh, speed settings on it, but it'll run generally either four to six weeks. 
on those four batteries. So that's pretty good. Obviously, with batteries, you gotta you gotta keep track of it. You gotta monitor them. You gotta make sure they don't die because if they do, um, then your fences, you know, or your hives are at, are at risk. Um, up in Maine, as as, uh, as uh, Eric earlier was saying <clears throat> uh, when I was mentioning Wyman's, and we'll see that you know they use these energizers because they're only uh, setting things up for about three to six weeks or something. So they can get by with just one of these little units and that's all they need for the season. If you're gonna run it all year or all season, I should say, you know, spring to fall or, or, or year round, mm, there are other issues with battery. So, um, and we'll get into that. Winter can be a little tricky. Next, you have something called a unigizer. And a unigizer is basically just a brand name, but it is the ability to run on both plug-in or 110 and 12 volt. Um, this unit here comes with two different sets of leads, one for a 12 volt battery hookup, and then one for your, your plug. Greatest flexibility, again, pretty economical so that you know, you're not paying a ton um, and um, very convenient. You know, if you lose power for a few days or something, you can take the battery out of your car if you're desperate and hook it up to your fence so that you, you don't uh, risk having that fence uh, unpowered for a certain amount of time. Again, it doesn't take long for bears to, to uh, discover it, especially if, uh, if there's no juice in there. All right, and so lastly, we have our sort of fourth option, which is solar, a very common uh, style of energizer. Um, lots of pros and cons with solar. Biggest uh, pro, I would say, is just the flexibility of being able to be remote. Um, the biggest con I would say probably is that, you know, it's a little bit more, it's certainly more expensive, almost three times as expensive when you consider you got the panel and the battery and everything in there, um, than a plug-in I should say. Um, but it also, you know, just like any battery unit, it requires some maintenance. Um, it's important to understand the solar energizer does have a battery in it. Some folks forget that uh, because it needs to run at night or on cloudy days. So it's not just strictly a solar panel. The batteries that come in these units are generally sized so that the unit could run a number of days, even if the panel was completely obscured. You know, if you had snow on the panel or you know, lots of cloudy days in a row, it's still even during cloudy days, it's still going to charge. But you know, we've done we do lab tests with our energizers that we sell, and we'll we'll take a piece of uh, cardboard and just put it over the panel and we'll run it on the bench or whatever and just see how long it lasts with that battery. You know, generally most of these are sized appropriately so they'll go a number of days without uh, any sunlight. When it comes to winter and things like that, it's really important you keep track of the voltage in the battery. Um, I also like to mention, and I'll do this at the end too, but when you're testing batteries and when you're testing fence, those are two different devices that you need to test. There is a fence tester, which will monitor and check the voltage uh, in the fence. And again, we're, ta we're talking about thousands of volts, very low amperage, but thousands of volts. Unlike uh, your, your multimeter, which is what you would use to test the battery. And here you're testing for you know, 12 volts, um, 13, you know, something in that range. Generally, some of these batteries are six volt, but uh, so you know, completely different tools. Don't ever use your multimeter to check the voltage in your fence. You will damage it for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's about it with solar. Obviously, you're going to face it south. Okay, it comes no brain there. All right. Let's show you some photos here of some beehive setups. And what I've done is I've, I've put some together that are, are um, each one is unique. It has maybe one or two things that could be improved. So I like to point those out because it's good for you to see real world examples. Um, this photo here, perhaps one of the better ones, although you know clearly this is sort of a fall photo, there is one big um, issue perhaps with this, but this photo is a good representation of uh, one of the basic bee fence kits that we sell. It's a, and again, I, I want to just put out there, I'm not trying to be salesman today. This is just, I'm showing you examples, but these are all things that um, we do offer, our company offers. Regardless of who you get it from, it's important that you, know, you keep track of all of these different factors. So 
Um, this is a 50 foot section of netting, um, allows you to have up to, I'd say you could probably fit six hives in there pretty easily on that pallet and still have enough room so that the bear can't reach over the fence and, in and touch the hives. Another thing that you'll mention is the energizer. In this case, it's a solar one, it's facing away from us, but um, that is inside the fence. Important to put it inside the fence because you don't want the bear to mess with it. You also wouldn't want the bear to walk around the fence and accidentally trip on or disconnect the lead, which is the unit, the, the, the wire going from the energizer to the fence. You know, if they disconnect that, then your fence isn't powered anymore. And so they'll figure that out pretty quickly. So by putting it inside, still within reach so that you can turn it off, or in this case, we have a little alligator clip that you can reach over and, and un undo uh, just to remove the voltage from the fence so that you can climb in if you need to work on things. But um, that is a pretty good representation of a nice setup. The only thing that isn't as good in this picture is the fact that we have a lot of leaves around the bottom of the fence. And leaves create a little bit of an insulation between the animal's feet and the ground. If they're wet leaves, maybe not a problem, but if they're really dry leaves, then that can inhibit the flow of that return voltage that I talked about in the beginning. So really important with any electric fence that you make sure to do your due diligence and, and keep the, um, the bottom of the fence underneath, you know, vegetation underneath and um, anything around the outside clear of um, both vegetation growing up into the fence as well as in this case, you know, leaves and such that might create an insulating uh, pad. All right, similar setup here, same netting, different energizer, but still the same, you know, this is a point one five joule, so not a lot, right? Pretty small energizer, um, but it does the trick. Maybe a little bit of a little bit much vegetation in this. Um, ferns, you can see some of these ferns are growing right up through the net, um, and they will affect the voltage a little bit. Um, so as will the grass. The grass will even more so. When it really becomes a problem is when that grass really grows into the net. So in this case, it's best to, to pick up the net, do a little weed whacking or mowing, and then put it back down. There's, there's no doubt, and I won't deny the fact that you need to maintain your electric fence. An electric fence in general requires maintenance. Um, however, you know, so do your hives. <laughs> so when you're out there, um, every you know couple of weeks or whatever, just make sure you, you trim underneath. Now you can put other uh, vegetation barriers underneath. I've seen people do landscape cloth, um, old sections of carpet. Some people do wood chips. All of these things are okay, but it's really important to remember not to make them too big, not too wide underneath the fence because you don't, again, wood chips, you know, they can be a little bit insulating as well. Anything that's going to dry out and be kind of airy is not going to give a good ground field um, to your wildlife. Bears maybe not as much an issue because they're pretty heavy. And you know, generally when they're coming up to the fence, they're on all fours. So their back feet are at least touching something like the grass. But if you have a problem with skunks or some other uh, critters, you know, they're small and they can, they're fairly lightweight. So they might be standing on, on all of those wood chips and they wouldn't feel as much of a shock. So it's kind of a happy medium between putting too much underneath the fence and insulating it and preventing them from getting a shock. Um, and not putting anything in and having the uh, vegetation take over. When I do this presentation in, in live audiences, it's, it's always, I like to play the guessing game because I'll ask people to tell me what's wrong in the photo. In this case, it's a little, a little more challenging with the uh, virtual format. However, here's another one that, uh, again, little perhaps excess vegetation. I would probably uh, cut that back a bit. Solar energizer. Again, these are all netting shots here. Um, that solar energizer, it's okay, but it looks to me like it's sort of in a shady area in this case. Um, make sure when you're locating that energizer, you're putting it in the spot that receives the most amount of sun each day. That's generally where you're gonna wanna start the beginning of your net as well. It's only 50 feet. So wherever you start that first post should be where you want that energizer, where the sun is gonna be the longest. 
Um, another potential issue here is on this, and we'll talk about it a little bit coming up, they have a, a warning light. You can see it right in the front here um, called a fence alert. And that's a really nice device to have. It's not too expensive, but it will start flashing when there's a problem with your fence. And in this case, I like, you know, I, I really like these, but it's important you hang them as close to a post as possible. You can see that, you know, it's not that far away from a post, but already the weight of this unit is pulling the fence down. So whenever you hang anything on the fence, and whether it's baiting, and we'll talk about that coming up, or these fence alerts, try and hang them next to a post to help uh, keep that weight uh, away from you know, sagging the, the middle of the fence down. The last thing I always point out in this photo, and again, this isn't always something that's preventable, but um, this fence is installed right up against the woods. And you know that, like I said, in this case, it's probably not much you can do about that. But if possible, try and leave a buffer between the woods and your fence. Wildlife generally uh, don't like to be exposed. They like to use the woods uh, to hide in. You know, deer, maybe more so. Bears can be a little bit more curious. And, and a lot of these like urban bears I was talking about really don't care. So it's probably not a factor. But if possible, you know, give yourself a little bit of a buffer between the woods and uh, your fence. This other, per the, the other thing in this photo, somebody has a couple of these night guards flashing lights in the corners. Um, some people love them. Some people say they don't work. Uh, I would leave that up to you, <laughs> but you know, certainly doesn't hurt. All right, this last photo of netting I have, this is a little bit different. This is again netting, and I should mention a lot of the nets that we do, and these previous ones that you saw are about 35 inches tall. These are all 35 inch nets. So not very tall, right? Enough that you know you could swing a leg over in some cases. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, that's not very tall for a bear. Again, it's a psychological fence. We're not concerned about height so much here or physical durability. It's the psychological factor that's really gonna pack the punch and, uh, and deter them. We do have a 42 inch net and, and some folks are migrating more towards the, using the 42 inch net versus the 35, just to add a little bit of height. Um, we've had some reports of jumping bears. So that is a, certainly something to consider. This net and it's uh, a little different is a positive slash negative net. It's a pos neg net. I won't go into to it uh, too much detail, but this net basically uh, where it's strength is, uh, is helping you in conditions that are really dry or in winter. Um, winter, uh, there's numerous things you need to, to kind of keep track of in the winter, but primarily, you know, because there's snow on the ground and or dry and frozen conditions, dry freezing ground is not a very good conductor. It's not, um, it's not going to carry that return voltage back to your energizer very well. So uh, a pause neg net will help you by every every other one of these strands that you can see in the fence is a negative. And so what happens is the bear going into this or reaching through it or coming up and touching it, by touching two of these wires, that's where it's going to get a really strong shock. Um, pause neg net can be more to maintain, however, because every time vegetation or anything comes into contact in this fence or grass grows up into it, you automatically have a dead short. You know, it's really going to bring that fence voltage down very quickly. Because one blade of grass contacting a negative and contacting a positive, um, those cancel out and they really bring your, your fence down. The other uh, obvious thing here I point out in this case uh, is the energizer is on the outside of the fence. So again, wildlife, and particularly deer and bears, Anytime they want to get into something, they're going to explore it first and they're going to walk the whole perimeter. They're going to walk around and look for the easiest entry. You know, did you leave a gate open? Is there is the fence down? Is, you know, did a branch land on it? And it's easy to just walk in. That's what they're looking for. And in doing so, walking around this fence, a good chance they're going to come into contact with those leads. And those are just alligator clipped on there. So if they pop those leads off, now your fence is dead. So in this case, I would move that energizer. Uh, to the inside. All right, that's the last netting photo. Now there's other types of nets or other types of fence I talked about in the beginning. 
smooth strands, other things like that. This is another way to do a beehive fence. And what you choose to do is ultimately up to you. There's certainly different factors, um, pros and cons to each. So that's why I'm sort of demonstrating some of the possibilities that are out there. Of course, our companies you know, specialize in helping folks decide what is going to be best for them. This fence that you're looking at is an aluminum wire fence, four strands. In this case, they're all positive, all hot wires. Pretty good. They're high off the ground. So, you know, in this area doesn't look like the vegetation is too strong. So it's a little mossy, it's not going to grow up into it too easily. Um, and those are uh, fiberglass rods that are holding it up. I believe they're painted brown just to kind of make them uh, blend in a little bit more. And on the far corner, you can almost see there's four gate handles. That's how you get in and out of this fence. Um, and it's hooked up over here. I actually don't know where the energizer is in this particular photo. I don't know if it's a battery unit or uh, there might be a line coming from a, from a plug-in. But regardless, this is certainly a fine fence. It is uh, what's really nice about aluminum strands like this is they're very conductive. They transfer and transmit your voltage very evenly. The downside in this particular case, there's, there's two things that uh, I point out with this slide. One is that aluminum, while we can pretty well see it here, there's other wildlife that can't see it, um, specifically deer. So, you know, nighttime or daytime, a deer running through the woods, if they were to pop out of the woods being chased from, by something, they could hit this fence just because they didn't see it. And then, of course, uh, the fence could you know, go down, um, and that's an issue. So anytime you have or you're using wire, it's a good idea to sometimes alternate or at least put one strand of something more visible in there. We do sell an electric tape that is a half inch wide, white and black, that provides good visibility. Some people hang flagging off of the wire, which is regular you know, uh, tree flagging. That's fine. If you want to look at it, um, it does blow in the breeze, which is nice. But there are other ways you know can add some some visibility to it. The other thing that I point out with this slide, as I just mentioned previously, with bears walking around the perimeter of the fence looking for the easy entrance. Here we have some guy wires holding up the corners. They're going to trip on those and either break them or cause them to come loose. And if if those guy wires are really doing their job and they're holding that post up, you know, now your post is going to lean to the inside uh, and that'll be a weak point as well. So if you do need extra support in the corners, we recommend just using another post, another support post, rather than a guy wire like that. All right, I'm moving right along quickly here. Um, Tony, just interrupt me if you have any questions that pop up. Will do. Here is your um, Beehives up in Maine. This is Wyman's blueberries. Again, they just truck these things on in on, on tractor trailer trucks. In this case, they got three strands of a very uh, thin, it's called poly wire. It's got you know stainless steel and tinned copper conductors that run through it. Um, and it works fine for them. They've had to, I know this is an older photo as you can see, but they've had to adapt a little bit. The bears are getting smarter and they're starting to jump. So they've had to go a little taller. Um, they have very rugged ground up there, as you can see with the, the rocks in the foreground. So they use rebar in this case to get their posts in. Uh, and that's fine. You can do that. The, the one thing I don't like about this photo is the energizer in this case is actually sitting right on the ground. Um, that is generally not a good thing to do because it, it allows moisture to get into that energizer more easily, as does um, you know, insects will, will get in there. Insects can cause problems inside. Uh, we've had over the years, you know, we, we repair energizers and over the years we've had a number of them come back and insects, and, you know, ants, earwigs, other things like that have gotten in there and they've actually uh, caused damage to the board and uh, short circuited things. So do keep your energizers up off the ground. This is a little bit of a hybrid. It's kind of an odd picture, but I throw it in here just to kind of show you the possibilities. Um, this person has a lot of stuff going on here as far as fence. There's a chain link one in the back, there's a picket fence, there's a split rail fence, and now they have this electric fence around that. Um, but that's okay. The important thing is here, they are protecting all of these um, with these four or five strands rather of, um, this is a um, IntelliBraid uh, twine, I think it is, 
you know, again, pretty, pretty thin diameter twine, but it has the same conductive filaments in it. A uh, little solar energizer here, again, with a battery. Um, and, you know, a mix of insulators for, for various posts. Um, I don't know how many of you may have a Slovenian hive or Slovenian bee house, I guess it's referred to, uh, but this person here uh, put in a fence around their entire bee house. Obviously a pretty nice facility. You wouldn't want a bear to get in there and rip the whole thing apart. So uh, here you have a little, a little bit of a mix of, this is a pause neg fence. I know that because um, this person has it wired so that every other strand, so the lines going from the bottom, one, three, and five are negative or can be negative, I should say. And then lines two, four, six are always, always hot, always positive. This is a good fence for being able to switch depending on the season. You can, during the summer months, spring, summer, and fall, you can have all six strands hot. And then with a the throw of a switch, you can make every other line negative. And what that's good for is in the winter, as I mentioned, when you have those dry and uh, less conductive soils, um, then any bear trying to get in would have to touch two strands, but touching a negative and a positive at the same time will ensure that they get a good shock because the, the negative wires are grounded and they go right to the ground, unit or ground terminal on the energizer and the positives obviously are carrying the positive current from the energizer. So it's a, it's a nice complete completion of the circuit. Lastly, I kind of throw this in and, and someday I'm probably going to show it to somebody whose fence it is, but I, I throw this in because this is almost an example of what not to do. Um, this is a hybrid of both physical and electrical fence. You have pretty sturdy posts. You have uh, some wire, um, but I think there's nine strands here. Pretty tedious if you ask me. Um, kind of a lot to get into with all these gate handles, having to undo those every time. Uh, there are better ways to do this. <laughs> it might be Fort Knox, but um, it's going to take you a little while. So, Real briefly, I like to talk about the netting, going back to this, because it is probably one of the most popular beehive fences that we sell. It's easy. It's, it's relatively um, inexpensive for, for the whole kit that you get, but it's really important that you set it up properly. Netting comes rolled up, all of the posts together. When you unroll it, um, you just put that first post in, and as you walk backwards, that next post will just kind of come loose in your hands. Just toss it behind you, and then keep walking backwards. You do this all the way around until you get back to the beginning post, and then you go back around and set up. I, we do have a whole series of, of photos on how to do this. I didn't want to include here because it's beyond the scope of this uh, lecture, but. Um, we do have instructions and brochures about setting up electric netting if you need, and a video for that matter, if you need some um, guidance on how to do that. Things to watch out for, and when you're, when you're setting it up, you know, pull, this is a picture of pulling the fence with your foot to make sure it's nice and tight. You want your netting to be taut, um, try and avoid any sagging. This netting, um, it has the, the electronet, it's called an electrostop, 42 inch. It has semi-rigid plastic verticals. So when you set it up, it really stands up nice and, and straight. That's those, those semi-rigid verticals are helping to do that. But if you don't pull it tight, then, then it can have a tendency to sag. The other thing you might want to watch out for is hooking. That, that bottom strand that sits right on the ground, that doesn't carry any voltage. That's a ground wire, or in this case, a neutral wire for, for most beehive setup. Um, but the next one up does carry voltage. So you want to be careful that uh, it doesn't get wrapped around one of these uh, spikes in the netting. Lastly, and again, this is a very condensed little uh, demonstration on the netting, but when you go to, if you take up your netting in the winter, and a lot of people don't, I might add, uh, but if you do, or you move your beehive or whatever, um, when you roll up netting, don't roll from one end clear to the other. It's designed to be collected by going to each post and it's sort of accordions. Um, if you roll from one end to the other, A, it's gonna take you forever and B, it's, gonna, it's generally gonna create a mess. So um, again, you can go out to our website. There's other information about setting up netting. We're at 7.45. I just got a few slides left here on, on mistakes and such. Winner, I just mentioned, um, 
you know, if you have a solar energizer, that's the biggest time you're going to want to really monitor the battery because either like in this photo, I realize it's a, a sheet photo, but nonetheless, you can see that panel is pretty well obscured by snow. Uh, and if that doesn't melt off for, you know, a week, uh, or if the snow gets so high, you get it three feet of snow in some places or whatever, uh, then the panel again, it, it won't clear off and, uh, and then your battery will drain down. What happens is when your battery gets below a certain level, generally you know, 40% or so, then it's susceptible to freezing. And when your battery freezes, then there's a good chance it's, it's toast. Um, and so you're gonna have to get a new battery. So any, any solar energizer, really make sure that you're checking that battery uh, and you're, doing, you're making sure that the panel is doing its job of keeping it well charged. The other obvious thing about winter being the grounding issue um, and snow on the ground, uh, pause neg fences is a good way to get around that. Um, but one of the bigger things we'll get to next, which is talking about training. So I have here just a few common mistakes that are made with electric fence. We have a, a list of about six in our catalog, but I picked out the three that I feel are the most important and most pertinent for the types of fences that uh, beekeeping groups will come into. So grounding, training, and monitoring. Let's get into it. First one, grounding. Um, again, that antenna, that ground field is, is so important. It's equally as important as the connection to your fence. If the voltage can't find a way back to the ground field, then you know, it, you're not going to have a good, a good shock um, provided to that, to that critter. We like to use galvanized steel rods, uh, insulated wire if you're using a plug-in unit going from your installation out to the fence. Uh, if you're using a battery unit or a solar unit, it comes with a little lead um, that you can see in this picture. It's a green lead that goes to the ground field or brown rod. Um, however, in this picture, I don't like it because it's just steel rebar. You know, that's going to work. That's fine. But it's not galvanized. It will corrode. It will oxidize. And uh, that will inhibit the connection between the alligator clip and the steel itself. <clears throat> and when that happens, then it's just not as good a, uh, a path uh, for that return. Another thing I see, like on the opposite side, on the right-hand side, you'll see that rebar. This is a different photo, but still somebody using rebar. But they use copper stranded wire. We don't like to use copper with electric fencing either. Um, unless it has some um, corrosion preventative around it. So like tin copper is okay, but bare copper will oxidize as well. And you'll get that greenish uh, rust. And that will also inhibit the ability of uh, electrons to flow. So much like, um, you know, it's okay generally for your, your utility ground, you're dealing with much less voltage there, um, but with electric fencing, being such a, a higher amount of voltage, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand volts, um, that copper will oxidize pretty quickly. And what happens is we get calls every year, you know, hey, my fence is working great. Last year, I did nothing. I didn't change anything. I set it up this year and now I can't get, you know, even half the voltage. Go through the troubleshooting steps. We learn that they have a copper ground field and yes, it's slightly green. Get out your wire brush, disconnect everything, clean it up put it back together and voila, it works again. To avoid yourself uh, doing that every year, just start with galvanized steel. That'll really save you some trouble. So those are the, the things I like to mention about, about grounding. You can never oh, have oh. enough, or you can never have too much grounding. Um, there is a general rule of thumb for every joule of the energizer, about four to six feet of ground rod. And that works for the most part. Um, but don't be afraid to always add more ground rods. If you do, you'd like to go about 10 feet away, add the other one, and then connect the two with a uh, piece of insulated wire. Uh, uh, Colin, go um, I've got a question. Yeah. I live uh, where I'm gonna have my hives this coming season on the side of a hill, and it's all ledge. I, I don't think I'll get two feet before I hit solid rock. Mm -hmm. um, what do you recommend for grounding in, in that situation? On that ledge hillside, is do you have some vegetation growing on the, you know, is there at least a layer of loam or something on top yes. of it? Yes. Okay. What you can do in cases like that is you're gonna have to use, um, again, another metal, ideally galvanized uh, piece of metal, but you're gonna lay it on top 
or you can you can take ground rods and sort of bury them either diagonally or somewhat horizontally in the soil. That's okay. It's certainly better than nothing. Um, but another way to do it, and we do this a, a lot with um, portable and, and, and mobile like uh, poultry setups and things like that, is to take uh, something like either a hog panel, galvanized hog panel, or a section of chain link fence or something like that, and lay it down on the grass. And then that acts as your ground field. Um, and especially if the grass grows into it after a week or two, that'll really help. Um, but I, I totally understand if you if you can get a ground rod down even two feet, that's fine. And if you have a bunch sticking up, you can always whack it off, go 10 feet and pound the rest of it and then connect the two together. Um, a combination of doing that and laying something on the ground is fine. But obviously laying something on the ground, you do have to be aware of anything else that might be walking around in that area because even the ground field will sometimes have stray voltage in it. So if this is an area that might, you know, in your backyard or whatever, that might have children walking around in bare feet or something. You might not want that, but um, it'll certainly it'll certainly do the job of creating a, a ground field for you. So, good question. Thank you. All right, um, just a few more. Again, here's another picture. This is an exa example of an energizer that is sold just like this, but the stake that's holding up the energizer is, or the instructions tell the user to use that as the ground field. In most cases, that's not adequate enough. Um, like I said, you can never have too much ground. So when in doubt, you know, pound a separate ground rod or something next to this uh, and use that instead of whatever comes with the unit. This stake might only go in the ground eight to 10 inches. And, you know, it might work for a little bit, but as soon as you get some vegetation growing in there, it's gonna really affect it. So I would recommend uh, a separate ground field. All right, next common, probably one of the most important factors in any electric fence is training. You have to train your predators, your wildlife, and or your livestock, if you're doing that, to the fence. This is an electric fence. You know it's electric because you're buying it and you're setting it up and you probably zap yourself once or whatever. So you know it's electric, but your wildlife don't know that. So you need to tell them, you need to teach them. Education is so important here. So how do we do that? Sounds cruel, but in the end, this is the best way to do it. Anything that is attractive to them, any kind of food, if you can get that to be attached to the fence in some way that is going to conduct electricity, that will help draw them over to it. They'll get a shock. Generally, it's a head shock, something in the nose or mouth. Those two surfaces are very conductive um, and, and they'll really feel it and they'll get they'll get the, uh, the picture pretty quickly. Generally only takes one time. Um, this example here is bacon, raw bacon wrapped on the fence. Um, that's okay, people do that. Um, personally, not my favorite because it's greasy and it's messy. And you can see there's some stuff growing on the fence a little bit there, but, and then when it dries out, it might not be quite as conductive, but it does, you know, it, it certainly, does the job uh, first time a bear touches it. We train everything, you know, we train livestock. These are our sheep on our farm and we train them to the fence every year. Even if these are older, older ewes, we train them to the fence in the fall. And again, in the spring, we put the feed right along the fence and inevitably they get careless as they're eating and their ears touch it or their nose touches it and they get a little zap and they learn. Um, here's an example of same thing for other wildlife, deer, horses, uh, well, horses aren't wildlife, but We'll, we'll put that wedge of, ho of apple on a fence for a horse. They'll come over, they'll nibble it. You know, if it's a nice moist apple, they'll get a good shot. That little scent cap, as it's called, the gold bottle cap there is, again, conductive. It has a cotton ball up inside there. And we put a little drop of apple scent up inside. It's con concentrated apple that you can buy. And that will help, you know, if, if they smell it, and, you know, a long distance away and they'll come over and sniff it or lick it and get a good shock. Just like I said, right where, you, right where it counts. This bacon, as you can see, you know, something touched it. There's some hair <laughs> dangling off the fence there, but um, you know, again, it, it can be a little bit messy. This is probably one of my more favorite baiting techniques, especially for bear. This is your tuna can method. Take a tuna can, make yourself a sandwich, leave a little bit of tuna in there, 
And then when you when you open the can, leave part of it attached, right? Leave about a quarter of it attached so that you can use it as that lid. And you can, you know, a number of ways to do it. I don't really care how you do it. Um, just so long as the, the connection point between the can and the fence is conducted. On the left, we have a high tensile fence, which you probably wouldn't use with, with protecting beehives. But you can see that the lid is folded over. This is a great one for coyotes, keeping coyotes out of the sheep pasture and that kind of thing. On the right-hand side is a bear fence. You can see this person put some tuna in there. They wired it with some galvanized wire to the fence. Again, all conductive, that tuna can. Um, is very charged, smells great. Bears come over, they sniff it, stick their nose in there, and they're gonna get a good shot. Um, when you're hanging it, just like I mentioned earlier with the fence alert, hang it near a post because it can, it can add up with some weight. Um, uh, also with this method, um, make sure you punch a few holes in the bottom, you can almost see it there, so that water drains out and um, it doesn't create more weight. You know, you will have to rebate this and, and refresh the bait, so to speak, after uh, a little while, you know, maybe every couple of weeks or something. But there's always new bears coming into the area, indoor wildlife. So uh, make sure that you, you keep on the, on the baiting. All right, we're going to try this next piece. I have a couple of videos here for you, and we'll hopefully they'll play. This first one is bear touching the fence. It's pretty quick, um, but as you can see here. Boom, just put its paw on the fence and that was enough. Again, the pad was, was pretty conductive. Um, that soil there was conductive enough that and I don't know what the voltage was in here, but that was enough and he just went running. Now, this next video could be a problem, right? Here you have some cubs, same fence, same camera. They're already in there. This is where the video starts. If you look at the fence, I see one, two, three, four strands. They have obviously figured out a way in there. And it's probably the same way that, that they get out. And I'm just gonna play it now. And they don't know what they're doing. They're just little cubs. Zing, there they go. The problem that you could probably run into here is if they are in there and the mama has a problem, she's gonna find a way to get in there. And that might be, you know, they get zapped and they make noise or whatever, she's gonna be, pretty upset and, and she might just go tearing through that fence to get to them. But what you could do perhaps to alleviate this very easily is just add additional lines down low. It looked like they went right under that fence with no, no trouble at all. So keeping track of your fence, monitoring your fence uh, brings us to our next important thing. Colin, um, yep. Bernie had a question. Is loam more conductive than gravel? For is loam more conductive than gravel? Yes. Yeah, anything that's going to hold moisture. Your loam, generally, unless you know it's just loam, and it's going to dry out in the sun, but that will hold moisture. Gravel, you know, rocks, anything like that is is not very conductive at all. Um, so, yep. Hope that answers it. Thank you. Yep. Um, just a few more slides here, guys. This is a fence alert, as I mentioned. Flashes when your um, fence stops working, all right? The, the one on the left is called a live light and that will pulse with every, or flash with every pulse of the fence. It does require its own ground field, uh, but it is a very bright light. We like the fence alert in these particular, for, for your application, your beehive um, folks, the fence alert is probably a better instrument. Um, I like it because most of the time it's off. You have it on the fence, it does, by the way, have a little small you know, watch battery in there that will help power the light when the fence is off. But for the most part, it hangs on your fence and you forget about it. As soon as you have a problem or uh, forget to turn the energizer back on, that light will start flashing at you, indicating you have a problem. So again, you'll notice it most of the time, not doing anything. Um, so again, this this whole issue is not monitoring your fence. You can have an electric fence, but if you don't monitor the voltage or keep track of it, um, that's not going to do you any good. Here's an example of, you know, post on the wrong side of the fence. The fence is sagging. What happens then is that bottom strand is going to come into contact with the, with the vegetation or, or ground, and it'll start to short out. Any shorts in your fence are going to bring down that overall voltage. We really aim for a, a target voltage of somewhere between 
at least over 5,000 volts. You know, you can get it up in the eight and 9,000 range. That's really good. Uh, and the reason is too, because then you have a little bit of a buffer. If something does happen, you know, a branch falls on it or grass does start to well, you know that that fence is still gonna be adequate. Test your fence. Again, I mentioned in the beginning, two different types of testers, a voltmeter um, that you would use to test a battery or something like that, a multimeter. You, know, you might buy an AutoZone or something like that. What you're seeing here, although it's a little sophisticated one, is a fence tester. There's lots of different kinds of fence testers. You don't need that super expensive one. You just need something that gives you an idea of the voltage. And I, the common, common joke is, oh, that's okay. I have my spouse. They're my fence tester. That's great. Your spouse can test it. They can say, ow, oh, but everybody's wearing different footwear and everybody has different pain tolerances. It's not going to give you a very good quantitative um, reading. <laughs> so invest in one of these. They range from you know seventeen dollars up. You know the, the digital voltmeter there you see in the middle. That's my personal favorite. It's about thirty nine dollars. Really accurate. Has a, a probe that you put in the ground and then you touch the uh, clip to your fence. Really good way of, of monitoring the voltage. Highly recommend it. In summary, here's your here's your mistakes. I added two to this right. So grounding we talked about the one that I didn't. That I sort of left out, but choosing the right or the mistake being choosing the wrong size size of energizer. If you have a big area and you choose a very small energizer, it's not going to do it. It's not going to be enough. Um, so and again, that's where you, know, you can consult us to make sure you have the right size. Improper training or lack there, you know, no training at all of wildlife to the fence, not monitoring your voltage conditions. And number five making sure you choose the right type of fence. You know, I showed you a bunch of different examples today, the netting, the smooth strands. Um, those different styles are out there for a reason. You know, everything's dependent on your situation, how portable you need to be, how visible you need to be, how much you know, your budget is, uh, there's all these different factors. So make sure you choose the right type. That's pretty much it. Um, love to take any questions you have. I have, and I'll just mention briefly, um, you can go to our website. We have various you know, beehive starter kits. If you don't have a fence at all, we also um, you know, have lots of pieces and parts. If you have an existing fence, but you just need to touch it up. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. So wellscroft.com is the site. And um, you know, we, we are happy to advise you and no obligation, of course, to buy from us. So that's just part of what we do. We're all about education. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask away. Um, Colin, I, I watched a lot of films on grizzly bears. Is their vision worse than the black bears? Because they always recommend to really have a large ribbon for the bear to, to see, or are the poultry fences, because they're white, a lot more visible to the bears? Well, I'm certainly not an expert on bear, um, different bears species uh, and whose vision is better. But what I can tell you is that, yes, it's nice to have um, contrasting colors, um, especially if you consider nighttime visibility and daytime visibility. <clears throat> Any, a lot of the conductors that we sell are black and white. You know, they'll have white bands or in, in a black band or the twisted rope. Um, and that's that's for that reason. So you have some contrast. Um, deer, especially, are notorious for for poor visibility and poor depth perception. Bears, um, their depth perception is probably a little bit better. Eyes more you know forward facing, whereas deer, um, they're looking a little bit more with per peripheral vision, so they can't judge depth as much. We do a lot of deer exclusion work, and um, we'll set up all kinds of different three D fences and things to to exclude deer, but. Um, when it comes to answering your question about between black bears and grizzlies, I would treat them the same. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Um. Uh, do you ever have to use an anti-dig thing? Um, like um, in the greenhouse where I wa work and we we grow out plants we actually have chicken wire that comes down the um, cyclone fence and about a foot and a half up and then it goes out 
about two feet. Yep. Um, That's a great question. <clears throat> um, yes, in some cases you do. And certainly as bears uh, learn about the fence and or if they don't have, primarily we see this in examples where they don't learn right off the bat. They don't have a good or bad, I should say, first experience with that fence. Um, so if they come up to it and they touch it and it's just, eh, it's, you know, look, if they can get into a hive and be stung all over the place and still go after that honey, you know, they can tolerate quite a bit. So that's why that bear fence needs to be hot and it needs to give a good, powerful punch the first time they touch it. Nose, mouth, anything like that. Where we see digging is when the voltage is not that great and or you have, a you know, at least the enticing distance between the ground and that first strand, you know, enough that they can weasel under there. So you may have to start a little lower. Um, if grounding is an issue, another thing I've seen people do, and, and like last year, we actually did, you know, we had pretty dry conditions and we start getting more tech support type troubleshooting uh, phone calls when that happens because the ground being so dry doesn't conduct moisture, therefore doesn't conduct your voltage. And um, so you need to come up with another way of getting that voltage through the animal. And one, one thing that you can do is set up some chicken wire around the perimeter on the outside on the ground. And that whole chicken wire type mattering, kind of welded wire, some people use hardware cloth, although that's a little more pricey. But um, if you connect that mat around the perimeter of your fence to the ground field on your energizer, then anytime the bear steps on that and touches the fence, that's a direct short, a direct close of that current. Um, and that will really help and certainly prevent the digging, I think. Um, okay. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. The question. Questions, anybody have any more questions for Colin? Um, someone asked if we, Colin, if you would uh, be able to send us a copy of your uh, slideshow for us to put on our private website. Sure, yep, I can, get, I can uh, talk to you about that, sure. Great. Does anyone else have any questions for Colin? Otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I have just one one quick question. Maybe it's not the uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if Colin would be able to answer this or not. But is there a recommended distance to have the electric fence from the entrance of, of a beehive? Um, because I've had, uh, I guess, last summer I was noticing it was almost acting like a bug zapper. It would just kind of zap the bees as they would go in and out of the hive, <laughs> which is not ideal. The fence was zapping the bees. So, well, we certainly advocate that you keep the hives at least, you know, an arm's distance away so that if a bear tries to reach over the fence, they're not touching the hive. Um, mm -hmm. You also would want to leave enough room. I mean, it would have to be very close to the hive for any arcing or uh, induction to occur between the fence and the hive. If you have like a tin um, cap over the top of your hive. If the fence comes into contact with that tin cap, you'll, you'll hear some arcing. In my opinion, that's way too close. Yeah, you, you certainly don't want it that close. Um, but there shouldn't be an issue as long as you're, you know, a couple feet away from the fence. If I, okay. I have a quick question. If our unit with the solar panel isn't working, but we don't know why, is there a way to diagnose it? Um, do we bring it to someone or, or way to figure out what's wrong with it? Yep. Um, so the first thing is generally, I'd say 90% of the uh, solar energizer issues we see are battery related. Um, the first thing would be to test the battery that's inside. Um, and, and you can go online and see what the proper voltage should be for the size battery that is in there. You'll generally either find a six volt battery or 12 volt battery, a brand new, 12 volt battery off the shelf should read close to 13 volts when you test it, anything below 12. And certainly if you get like six or five, uh, that's a dead battery. Now you can try charging it because it may be that it's just been um, decharged and depleted. Uh, but if you, so if you have a trickle charger or something like you would plug in 
to charge your car battery, anything like that. Charge it up and then test it. Uh, the real way to do it would be to charge the battery up, let it sit, um, you know, overnight, and then test it in the morning. If it drops significantly in the amount of voltage, meaning it doesn't keep it, it doesn't keep the voltage up, that's an indication the battery is no good um, and you just need a new battery. Other than that, the other problems, you know, the, the solar panels themselves are relatively, you know, inert. Not a lot goes on with them. Uh, you could have a lead issue in there, a wiring issue. Again, insects, if they got in there, could, could cause an issue. Uh, we do repair the energizers we sell, uh, and, and we primarily only support those because we have parts in stock. Not that you couldn't bring it to us and you know, we could take a look at it. Um, but I would certainly start with the battery. That, that's where I would start. And uh, if you just need a new battery, then that might, that might be the problem. That's great. Thank you so much. Yep. Good question. Excellent. Anyone else? Is there like a remote, something that can hook into a network or into the cell phone system that would send? Because I'm planning to put up a fence in the woods of Maine and I'm not going to be there that much. Is there a little monitoring system that I can hook into the Wi Fi or something? Well, my question would be, do you have Wi-Fi in Maine where that energizer is going to be installed? I, I, I do, actually, since okay. this last year. Um, okay. And I, I could rig it so it was on the network, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, um, it's funny you ask a little bit only because this year we have a new energizer we're carrying, the manufacturer came out with that is Wi-Fi capable. However, it is a, it's the biggest energizer we sell, massive. It's 46 joules not the kind of thing you would want to buy, you know, it's over a thousand dollars. So not what you would want to buy for a, a little beehive setup. It would certainly work, but way overkill and, and more than you'd want to spend. Um, I think that we're going to see more of that in the coming years. Um, right now, I don't know of a smaller, like one joule energizer that's Wi-Fi capable. There are Wi-Fi um, monitoring devices though, separate from the energizer that you can hook up to the fence. And I believe those will, I think there's a smartphone app that you can get for them and um, and those will do what you're looking for. Okay. So, yep. Thank you. That's a, a new area, I will be honest, a new area for us because there's not, you know, I think the electric energizers are a little behind the times when it comes to all the smart devices that are out there and the, the internet of things. So um, I think they'll catch up, but uh, not, a, not a ton of options about it for that right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Excellent. I'll um, just mention we also do, you know, estimates, free estimates, um, no obligation to buy, but if you just have a new setup, a new area, um, most of the beehive things are fairly straightforward. They're not complicated, doesn't require uh, lots of calculations and such, but um, if you're just unsure about how to start or you have a, a map of a diagram of an area that you're going to be setting up, maybe it's a garden and a beehive and some poultry over here, a bunch of different combination of things, uh, you know, let us know. We can help you help direct you to the right energizer to do all three things at once, save you money, be most efficient, that kind of thing. So that is a service we provide just uh, so everybody knows. Excellent. And it's Wells.com uh, if people wanted to, uh, to yep. check, well, it, uh, check it out and follow up. Follow up. Wellscroft.com. Um, products are there. You can contact us. Info at wellscroft.com is the uh, email if you have questions, or you can call our, call our uh, 800 number, 855 number uh, again. Excellent. Any advice? Uh, so I think. That's it, unless anyone has a last minute question. Um, unmute yourself and ask now, otherwise you'll have to uh, follow up with Colin directly at info at wellscroft.com. So going once, twice. Okay, well, thank you, Colin. Really appreciate the, the, uh, your presentation. And- uh, You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Very informative. Yeah. 
and uh, look forward to it again sometime if we have other members. And uh, we'll probably be doing some other uh, webinars, uh, Wells Crop hosted webinars. I know we'll have a beehive one coming up probably next month. So if there's anybody that would benefit from hearing this information again, uh, or if you have other members that, that um, missed it tonight, then um, keep an eye on our website for that information and uh, you can tune into that again as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. You're very okay, welcome. Have a good, good evening, everyone. We have another uh, seminar next week, and I'll be sending out a reminder about that. Until then, uh, have a good evening. I hope your bees are healthy and happy. Take care, everyone. Good night.